Well, I'm, 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 very, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, it seems to be a nice, nice environment, a nice college also, and you have some good, some good uh, topics that you're discussing. And, and I, I like to be in a place where you already are on, on, you could say on track and doing things. It's sometimes difficult to be in a place where people kind of very suspicious about all these green, green development schemes and all these very, you could say, very, very right projects. Well, I come from a community where nobody thought about being right, but they just thought about doing the right thing. And the right thing is not, I mean, it's not just straight out of the, ro out of the road. It's, it's, it's sometimes a winding road, and we have to go through that. So my, my story here is, is not to tell you how and uh, what to do. It's more like showing an example of what we did on this small island. And then I hope you, you get some inspiration, and we can have some discuss discussions or debate afterwards where we can talk about uh, what, what kind of rocks we had to move out of the road to, to be able to get, get on with the project and, and what was successful and what was less successful. So feel free to, to interrupt also through the, the presentation, and, but, but we'll certainly have time afterwards to, to ask questions and have a debate ab ab about what to do and, and uh, where we're going uh, for the future. Is that right? Can you see something? Okay, let's get on with it. Like, like it's already told, we won a competition to be the Danish Renewable Energy Island in 1997. It was a competition sent out because we had a history in Denmark of renewable energy, starting from the point where we decided not to have nuclear power. Um, in the 70s, we, did, we had the oil crisis. We had car-free Sundays in Denmark, where you on the highway could take your kids on a Sunday walk. There was no cars at all. Uh, and and, and these, these car-free Sundays told us that Oil was not kind of forever. Uh, there was a scarce resource, and, and uh, we had to do something about it. And then, because Denmark is not a, an oil producing country, we have some oil in the North Sea, some gas, but we are not self supplied. Uh, we had to realize that we should do something else. The utility companies, they wanted to have nuclear power. That was the way forward. They had the blueprint and the site ready to install the first uh, nuclear power station in Denmark so we could have uh, our, our energy from the nuclear power stations. But the public didn't think that was a good idea. So they had second thoughts about nuclear power, and we had a public movement that got, grew stronger and stronger in the 70s. And finally, in 1985, we had a government saying that, no, we cannot have nuclear power in Denmark because the public don't want it. So, so they decided not to have nuclear power in Denmark. And from then on, we naturally had to discover other means of production of, of energy for the country, for the nation. We have coal-fired power plants, we have gas-fired power plants, but we also needed to exploit the possibility of producing green energy from wind power, solar energy, and biomass. We have incinerators burning our waste, and these incinerators are connected to district heating schemes in the, in the capitals. So Copenhagen is mainly heated by waste. I mean, that's not entirely green energy, but it's, it's, it's then not wasted, the waste. It's reused and, and, and heats the houses. So it's, it's about ener intelligent energy systems where we try to get the best use out of production. Our power plants are all connected to district heating schemes, which means that when we produce energy from a power plant, the cooling of the power plant is then used to heat the houses in big district heating schemes. Miles and miles of pipes where we send the hot water from the cooling of the, of the power plants to, the, uh, to, to heat the houses. In many other places, you have electricity production, and then the cooling will just be cooled off in a river or in the sea, and then you have heating schemes in each of the houses. So this is another t type of intelligent energy, energy consumption or energy production. Wind power, solar, and, and biomass came in uh, after, after, after the oil crisis, but in, you could say in time, the, the government thought that we need to speed up this process. So they called, they, they called some, some experts saying, how can we do that? And they, they announced they wanted to have a competition and like always, already mentioned, this competition was sent out and they wanted a small independent community where they could measure every export, import, uh, kilowatt hour, so they could see the result of the, of the installation immediately. They could, they, could, they could measure, they could calculate or monitor uh, all the effects of the project. And there was one engineer in the mainland, he saw this competition, and he thought that this is going to be a neat project. He was a green engineer, a consultant of green buildings and construction. So he called the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce on Samsø on my island and said to him, I have this idea. I saw that there's an advertisement that we, we, can, now, we can now send in a competition, be part of a competition to be the Danish Energy Island. Shouldn't we do that? Because, I mean, he reckoned that, that would be a job for his company. And the, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce thought, this is a gra grand idea because this, is really, this will be jobs for my members. 
it'll create some jobs. But what he said, we need to call the mayor because he has to, to, to sign this, uh, this uh, competition or this master plan for the competition. And the mayor thought that this, is, this, this would mean four more years in the seat as a mayor. <laughs> So he said, yeah, that, let's do that. So these three guys, they, they, they decided that we should, we should enlist, we should be part of this competition. And all of a sudden, we won it. So we were, the, we were the Danish Renewable Energy Island, and we had to prove that we, in a time span of 10 years, by the means of proven technology and widespread public participation and ownership, and general rules and regulations and laws and subsidy programs, we were not fed any special treats to do this project. We should make this energy project. And only three guys knew about it. So from then, from, from then on, we had to convince the island that we, we were going to be the energy island. I was the first employee in the project, so it was quite a task to start the project. It was supposed to be in 10 years' time. It's quite, a, quite a challenge in 1997. Say that in 1997, we pledged to give up fossil fuel and convert to 100% renewable energy. It's a small island. It's a very small, let us see, 4, 000, a little more than 4,000 people, whole year round people. We have about 500,000. On a good season, we have 500,000 overnights. But you know all about tourism. You have much more here. Uh, 140 in square kilometers, 30 kilometers from south to north. Yeah. This is a Canadian cartoon, actually. I don't know why they mean. This was the situation before we started. As you, can re as you can see here, I mean, this is, this is, this is a, a situation out of balance. It, 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 we have stopped moving forward. We have too much, too much on the back to carry too many loads. So we had to find out which of these boxes we could, we could throw away without missing it. I mean, everybody on the island, we are just like everybody else. We'd like to have the next car should be a little bit bigger. I mean, we, preferably four-wheel drive and one, two extra cylinders, but just, to, just to be ready for any occasion. Well, there might be a situation where we needed the power. <laughs> and who wants to be the smallest car on the road? And all these sort of things. And, and we extended the buildings a little bit. We had bigger kitchens. We had new, all these sort of things. I mean, human behavior is strange sometimes. So these are all burdens on the wagon. And we had to think twice and, and redo this and find out how we could bring this poor donkey back on the road and get some move, forward movement again. We are a windy area. I mean, probably like you are on the coast here. We have a lot of wind. You can see that the trees has to acknowledge that they bend over. When they come above the, the cover, they just bend over because of this westerly wind. The resource is there. We know it's there. We can feel it every day. It's very windy. It's a natural resource. So why not wind power? I mean, it's natural. We shouldn't debate that at all. The wind power is there. We are an island. And on an island, you have to make decisions. Because, I mean, you cannot just go to somewhere else. You are on this island. This is a ge geographical spot. And, and I mean, you can, cannot go to the neighbor community. You are the community. And here, you have to make the decisions. You have this water surrounding you. This is a situation that's really obvious. You have some people on the island. These are the island people. They look familiar to you. I mean. It looked like any, any other islanders. And we, we wanted to listen to the island voices. It was supposed to be based on widespread public participation. I know we can discuss what, what that is, because nobody knew that when we started the project. What is public participation? But we wanted to hear what they wanted, these people. Because we knew they had a history. We have a history of wind power. 300 years ago, we had wind turbines. And farmers would go to the mill, get their grains milled, and cart it back again on a horse wagon. So there, there had not to be more than three kilometers to the nearest mill, because that was a day's trip on a horse wagon to mill the grain and go back again. So we had a, a, a wind turbine every three miles, no, every three kilometers. So we had more than 100 wind turbines on the island 300 years ago. We have dreams also. I mean, even being islanders, living the very practical life, we have still have dreams and visions about the future. Uh, I, I know I've, I've been told that this is a, a well-known uh, visionary thing, that at the end of the rainbow, there's a pot of gold. I don't know if you guys have, if, ever, ever struck any gold. Yeah, some, yeah there's somebody there. <laughs> but but the, vision, the vision is there. And this is, what, this is, this is a, a picture of the, of the vision of a, of a bright future. So we were wishing, at the end of a rain rainbow, we'd do something unusual, something special. So in 1997, when we did the planning, we said that we are going to have wind turbines, offshore wind turbines, in this project. I said, yeah, in your dreams. 
come on, it's never going to happen. Somewhere else maybe, but not on this island. And we are just a poor little crowd of people and we cannot handle big projects like this. So this picture is taken five years after, realized. And, the, and at that time, they were the biggest offshore wind turbines in the world. Only for half a year, then there was someone bigger because the development was very fast. But we were having the world record of offshore wind turbines owned by the local population. This is the island seen from Google. So this is you guy watching us, actually. <laughs> you invented the Google, I think, to keep an eye on us, to see what we're doing. <laughs> All right, but that's okay. Just to give you directions, th this, is, this is the South Island, and this is the North Island. We are actually two islands. You can see there's, a very, there's no hills here at all, and this is a, this is a protected area. It used to be seabed, but now it's, it's a very shallow protected bird, bird sanctuary. We have migrating birds there. We have geese. We have all sort of very rare birds in this area. It's highly protected. All these islands in this lagoon, you cannot, go on, you cannot go on shore there. You can sail there, but you're, they are all for the birds protected area. Down here in the south, we have the civilized developed area. We have the farming and the culture area. We have the capital of where the mayor's office is, the town hall. Here we have the harbor. We, my, me and my wife, Malena, over here, is, we live just a, one mile south of the harbor. We have a small farm there. We used to have horses and sheep and, and a little white dog. So if you go a step further in the Google, you can see the house with the white dog. That's where we live. And, and we live the, well, we live the normal life here. Out here, we have an, this isolated area prevented any communication in the, in the old days. So out here, you have a different community. They have to speak a different language, a different uh, dialect. And they have been very isolated for many years, these people here, because, I mean, in the old days, before the cars, 10, 12 kilometers was a long way of walking. So you didn't communicate so much with these people. So they had, I mean, they were isolated quite a lot, so they had to marry cousins and they, they kind of inbred up there. I can say I can sit away from home but if you if you go there you, if you take a careful look you can see they have triangular faces. They, they look a little awkward, a little, <laughs> little strange but they are nice people though. If you treat them well they, <laughs> they're good people. But this is, this is just to say that this is not just one easy little community. It's several communities in one community. And I probably, you probably know that people living in the village on the other side of the mountains or across the, the, the little bridge there, they are also stranger than you are. I mean, they're difficult. Diff, you're nodding here. There, there's somebody, <laughs> so, we recognize this situation in any community all over the world, in Japan and America. No matter where it is, everybody recognizes. This is just to tell that. Communication is a hard thing because you have to recognize their thinking and our thinking just in this little community. And this is, this is the task also to bring them together and see if we have common interest in development. So, do you know Denmark? In the north tip of, of Germany, we have Denmark. I mean, we used to be the Vikings. We ruled all of Europe almost at one time. But we were so busy fighting and drinking that we kind of lost control, so we... <laughs> We're now only this ward on top of Germany. <laughs> we, we are hardly recognized, and some people don't know we exist still. But here's, here we have Sweden, and here, down here we have Germany. And so this is Denmark. But I mean, the, the prime minister, or the minister of energy and environment, who announced us to be the energy island, he was a bit wise because you can see Samsø is right in the center of Denmark. So very nice demonstration project to have, have this island there. And this is Europe, the European Union. The new members, you can see this is uh, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and the Baltic area, and the Eastern Europe uh, countries, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, England. And if you make this almost per perfect circle of Europe, you can see Samsø is also the center of Europe. <laughs> the EU Commission also had some thinking in it, some, which I think is that's, it's good thinking. Nobody really expected that to be so, but, but you can see that's, that's actually the situation. And uh, this is the <laughs> I can see a lot of you are quite surprised. You thought that this place was the center of the Earth. <laughs> but I proved you wrong. It's not. It's Samso. Or maybe not. Because the point is that I think that the, the basic of development or, or, or of responsibility and understanding is that you consider your place as a center of the universe. And this is where you start your movement. This is where you start the next good step in the right direction. 
And this is where your responsibility is, is also. We have so much talk about climate change and global changes and only all these global big, big things, big movements. And I think it's good for the politicians to talk about global cooperation and international cooperation and responsibility. But for the individual, I think it's much more important that you do your best where you are. And if you do your bit and your neighbor do his bit and so on, then you have a snowball effect and soon everybody will be moving in the right direction. So I, I'd like to change the saying, um, think global and act local, to say, think and act local. I, 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 I think that is the right way of doing it. Because if you start thinking global, you're all mixed up. In, I mean, somebody else can do the stuff for you. We have to do something for the, island, for the polar bear. We have to do something in the rainforest. We have to do something everywhere else than where we are. So we can continue to behave the way we do. But let's, let's start with ourselves. OK. So why did we do it? Survival of the community is important. I mean, we know, we, we, we know that if we don't do anything in particular, then the community will stop being a community because businesses will move away. We, we have a very hard time attracting companies and industries to the, to, the, to the community because they want to be near the highway, near the city, near the, near the activity. They won't establish themselves out here. Somebody told us when we have the internet, they can easily come and stay decentralized out in the outskirts, but no. We've had the internet for ages now, but they still don't want to come out. Um, we also want to form a new strategy. <clears throat> I don't know why you, how, do you consider yourself as being a fishing community originally, or farming, fishing, farming, and forestry, but primary production, like, like we do. But the, but the farmers are so few now that we, have, we need to, to, to think differently. We are also a tourist com community. We are also a culture community. We have more and more writers, uh, poets, and artists living in the communities. And they, they actually make quite a good living. And they pay a lot of tax, these guys also. So maybe they are just e equally as important as the primary production, because the production from the farming is, is quite low in, 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 in income. And if they make any income, these farmers, they, they reinvest it in a new tractor, so they still don't pay tax. Maybe that's only in Denmark. <laughs> we want more jobs, better local economy, and we want to be independent also. There's no such thing as being independent and, and being able to make your own decisions. But many small, poor communities, they have to get funding subsidies from the government, from the central region, from all sorts of places. But, and all these subsidies are always connected to conditions. So we have, when we do the planning in the lo local administration, we have to find, find out where we can get our hands on, on, on some subsidies. But if all these subsidies are connected to conditions, then, then we, we are planning after the conditions, not after what we really want to do. So we can see all these small communities, they are kind of trying their best to follow this, this winding road of, of conditions for subsidies, which is not so good. So it's much better to be independent. And not, I mean, not energy independent. As I heard during the election campaign, I heard some some gal from Alaska saying that America needs to be any energy independent. <laughs> I can't recall her name, but you probably know who it is. <laughs> I thought that was that was that was grand. I mean, to, to plan to be energy independent in a country where you haven't been near that for the last 30 years, that's a challenge. I like you Americans. You really think that. <laughs> And CO2 neutrality is way down the list of arguments of why we should do that. Because, I mean, on an island out here, you can see the clear sky and the blue sea and all these sort of things. It doesn't feel like pollution. And you cannot smell CO2, you cannot see it. So it's not obvious that this is the reason why we should do it. Well, deep down, we know that CO2 is a problem. But it's very hard to understand the, 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 the necessity of handling because of the CO2. Because there's a lot of other reasons to, to be active and, and do things. We talk about energy democracy. Well, in Denmark, we have a corporate tradition. You probably also had that not so many years ago in America, where the farming community, they had to help each other. They formed dairy companies, they formed mills, and they formed other things. And they did it in, in kind of a cooperative spirit. So, but, but it's getting more and more individual, because, because of, you have to make your own fortune, you have to make your own destiny, and all these sort of things. The American lifestyle is very uh, individual, as, as far as I know. You have to teach me wrong if you uh, tell me wrong. But, but anyway, we, we, tr we mean we have a, a, we have a cooperative spirit on, in Denmark. But I think we are going the, right your way now. So what we are trying to, to do now is that we'd like to go back a bit and find a way to organize people so they can be co-owners or they can be co-organizational co, co uh, founders of new projects. 
which is a very strong and good way of organizing because it gives a great responsibility to the individual. And then we want to form some new local activities because when we create new energy projects, it's very important that local contractors, local business people, local suppliers are involved in this planning. I mean, it's very easy to call a big contracting company. You probably have some really strong and big contractors in America who can do the job. They just roll in with the whole equipment and they can do the job in no time. And then they roll out again and they leave everybody exhausted and say, what happened here? And you have all, everything has, has been constructed and done in, in no time. But it leaves the community as it was before, just with some new gadgets. It's much better to develop the projects with the local uh, trade people, the local businessmen, so they can, they can develop, they can get more skill, they can get a, what we call a capacity building. They can learn something and then can, then, then can be part of development and also be advocating new ideas because they can see that company can handle it. Establishment of wind turbines, building of district heating schemes and refurbishment of houses and stuff like that. So, so it's, it's good to have local activity. And there's no such thing as a contractor who's got a contract to make a district heating. He thinks that green energy is green. That, that's really good. He likes it. But um, he probably also would have liked to build a nuclear power station. Maybe even better, because there's a lot more concrete in a nuclear power station. So it's a pragmatic reason. You don't have to be an environmental hippie to like activity. So, so we have to tie these ends together and say that maybe the initiator is, is, is a green environmentalist. But the, but the activist behind it could be anybody who has an interest in this kind of development. So you have to, to make it pragmatic and invite everybody to participate in this project. That would be a much greater story to tell in the long winter nights afterwards. So to make this come through, I don't, I don't know if you understand this, but we need for, for, for making projects like this, we, meet, we need national targets. I mean a policy where you have feed-in tariffs and feed-in uh, feed tariff is, is, a, is a fixed price per kilowatt hour from a wind turbine. If you, if you invest in a wind turbine, it's good for you to know what is, the, what is the price per kilowatt hour when I sell my electricity to the grid, to the net. And if you ask the utility companies, what can I get for, per kilowatt hour from electricity, they'd say, well, it depends on the market. And you cannot, as a personal individual investor, go to the bank and say, I want to make an investment. OK, what's the yearly turnover? I don't know. It depends on the market. And they'll probably say to you, OK, do you have the money in cash? <laughs> you cannot have a bank loan here in my bank. So it's much better to know, and this is what, what we call the feed-in tariff. The government says that we have a target, like the Kyoto Protocol, saying that Denmark wants to have 21% CO2 reduction by 2020. And to, to meet this goal, we need to have so, so, so much wind power in the system. And to make, to make that happen, they make a feed-in tariff where they guarantee a minimum price per kilowatt hours for 10 years. So the day you sign the contract for a wind turbine, you know the price for the next 10 years, which make every individual able to go to the bank and say, I'd like to buy 10 shares. It'll cost me $5,000 or $1,000, depending on how many shares you want to buy. Can I, can I have a bank loan? Yeah, what do you think the turnover is? Yeah, here you have the investment plan and the 10 year payback. So, well, okay, the bank will say, yeah, you can have that because of this feed in tariffs, which means that everybody can participate. This is a really good thing. And then you can say, long, we, we, we also need long term agreements. This is not just, just shopping. You, you want to have a 10 year planning, not only four year, like an, an election period. I mean, you probably heard politicians promise everything. Is there any politicians here today? No? <laughs> oh, nobody who wants to volunteer. <laughs> OK. No, no, no. I, I was not going to. to I, what I mean is that many politicians, they have, their, they have ambitions about doing things about things. But when they are in government, when they have a seat there, I mean, everything is, is negotiation. And they will be in a situation where they have to bend over and say, OK, if I get this through, I have to give, give way for this, this uh, my, my opinion at the election campaign. And that might be wind power. If there's an opposition towards wind power, it's very easy for a politician to say, yeah, yeah, I mean we should have a green development, but you have to listen to the people of the area. And if there's, a, there's, a, there's an objection to the wind turbine, it won't happen. And when you cannot rely on that. So, and we also want investment capital. In, in Denmark, we also often get EU funding, but we have to come up with the initial investment ourselves. We have to find the money up front. Otherwise, we won't get any, any subsidy. Um, so this is essential that somebody is, is, is making risky investments. So we could say, if this happens, every community has to have a special plan. I cannot say that you should copy our plan. You should make your own plan based on the resources you have here. 
what kind of resources do you have? You have a lot of biomass from the forestry. You may ha might have some wind and some solar and whatever. So you come up with your own planning. Planning has to be public so everybody can discuss it and debate it. How can, can I, what can I do in this plan? We need local resources. I mean, you can always import, uh, you can import uh, wood pellets from Canada or you can import something else. And that's, that's okay for a, for a while until you have established your own production. The intention at the end of the day has to be that you base your development on local production. Um, and local business must be involved. And the result is, like I said before, more jobs, better local economy, local capacity building, and the money stays in the community. Because, I mean, if you import all your fuel, it costs you a lot. When we started the project on Samsø, the pr price of, of, uh, of oil was about $40 per barrel. And when last year it was $140 per barrel. So we were helped a lot by, by having the investments up front. So you could say that we had even more money staying on the island after this because we bought the heating from the next door neighbor. We bought the electricity from the wind turbines. We have an energy office. And this energy office provides public opening hours, information about renewable energy, assistant planning, work group meetings, education, campaigns and demonstration, open house meetings. All these things that will enlighten people so they can make decisions. I mean, we sit at home and think, it could be nice to have a wind turbine. I heard about these small wind turbines, you can put it on, on the roof. You probably heard about that too. You can have your own roof wind turbine. Imagine you have a village of a thousand houses with 1,000 wind turbines on the roof. That would be funny. <laughs> But, but this, is, this is all, if you, if you have your own mind and your own thinking, you come up with all sorts of ideas. It's very good to have a place to go and discuss this and talk about it. Also, if you want to make a co-op project or a community project, these guys at the energy office, where this is where I used to work, will then help you set up an organization structures, write the minutes from the meetings, call every individual for, for, the, for the meetings, do everything that is, I mean, all these inconvenience things that you have to do on a Sunday afternoon. And that'll be done in ha hand and you'll be called to meetings and everybody will be prepared and you are just the decision makers. That's easy, right? You should have, you should have an entity office. We help people by also very low tech uh, things like a wood a stone oven, a wood stove or uh, solar PV. This guy is actually my old math teacher at the primary school. <laughs> I didn't like him much then. But we have become friends afterwards because when he had his first calculator with a solar charger on it, he said that one day I'll, ha I'll have a solar installation on my roof because I like this. This is interesting. He's, he, he's a technology freak, <laughs> this guy. So now he has got 20 square meters of solar PV and he's producing about two, 3,000 kilowatt hours per year. And a normal house in Denmark uses about 5,000 kilowatt hours where a normal house in America uses maybe 10,000, almost double, a normal house. You probably don't live in normal houses. <laughs> but but his, his treat is that this guy, we have a net, we have a net metering system, which, says, which means that if his solar PV is producing more energy than his entire household, then the meter will run backwards. And he has got a small book, and in this book, every day he writes down if his meter has been running backwards. Have I been net producing or have I been net consuming? And he's got, got some, a star system starring when he had really success. <laughs> so, so he's been in National Geographic and Time magazine also because he, he, he announced that he's a retired teacher and he had a retirement pension in the bank and he, he didn't get a, get a lot of interest out of that. So he said that, well, maybe I should have some fun before I die. So he bought, he bought this installation, quite expensive actually, and, and he explains that it's so much more fun to have the money on the roof than in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and all the way to the big, to the big stuff, this is, this is the offshore wind turbine project. This is a, the project secretariat of, of the project. And, and we are also, this is me sitting down here, I was the project secretary. And this is the chairman, this is a local farmer. There was, a, there was an article in the New Yorker. And he was announced to be the beefy farmer from Samsø. He got these sound round, round cheeks. He, he get good food, this guy. But he's also a very interesting guy because he's very, he's very interested in all these green things also. And he's also very interested in money. He's a businessman. He likes to make money and business projects. We hired a professional director. He, he was the, the head of the project. And this is the accountant of the farmers organization. He's a very clever guy. He's doing all the tax audits from the, all the farmers. So he knows how to, to set up a, a, an audit and avoid paying tax. 
But to make this come true, we had a lot of meetings. I mean, we met and we met and we met, and we had gallons of coffee and tons of cookies <laughs> to, make, to make this, because it's, 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 it's a dialogue. We, we, need to, we need to talk about this and talk about what we want. What is the dream of this island? What is the dream of the individual? And how can we, can we be part of the process? This is very important that you feel that you're connected and you're part of the process, because otherwise you are out of the process. And you see many places that you have, you have foreign or, or other, other, you could say, not island companies that will come over and do the projects. And then you're not connected and you're very disappointed about this. But it, it's also a process to get to the point where you, you actually agree on this. What is our values and how can we agree on, on, a, on, a, on a common project uh, and do it all together? We, we, in the process, we had an engineer from the This guy who actually made the master plan. He actually moved to the island because he wanted to realize this project. This should be his last project. He was a, very close to retirement. So, but he was a very arrogant bastard. <laughs> I mean, you know, these, these engineers who know everything. Is there any engineers here today? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they can be so very arrogant. They know everything. They want to tell us how to, how to do things. And they, they can calculate and they can do things. But, but the good thing is, he and I, we worked very good together. I could be so angry at him because he was arrogant. But, but he was then the first one to present the project. He would present the figures, the, 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 hard, the hard knowledge about what, how, how things were, were, were done, the technology and the cost and all these sort of things. And I said to him, yeah, thank you very much. That was good. Sit down, please. And I'd say to them, well, my translation of what this guy just said. <laughs> and then we could start talking about all the, all the, you know, the soft question. I mean, the, all the, the personal questions about things. So I could translate it to local language because I am from the local community. I'm a local islander, which is maybe not all, always an advantage. But in this case, it was because I knew who to talk to and who was the most critical persons in the, in the room. And I would ask the first question to them because otherwise they'd kind of be very annoyed or disappointed by this. And then at the end of the meeting, they'll jump up and say that this is not good for the island. We, should, we shouldn't do the things like this. So instead of inviting them to, to, to participate and, and be advocating the good idea, that was much better. To form this, we made local heating. This is a work group. You could be a village. You want to be a village on Samsø? You are now the village people on Samsø. And we did it this way. In the beginning, we just came out and did this process. And we said, after this presentation, we had the engineer, and I advocated the good uh, opportunity of the community to do this project. And I said to them, shouldn't we do that? Wouldn't that be very, very nice? And it was all quiet in the room. And I said, anybody wants to participate in the work group to make this come true? Can we have any volunteers? No? And nobody, everybody sat on their hands. Because we have so many organizations on the island. Every time we have a new idea, they form an organization. And they elect a chairman, and a cashier, and a and oh, everybody there. No, not again. That's probably different here. <laughs> but no, 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 they didn't want to do that. So we found out that it was a very bad idea to try to press to, to what it put a pressure on people like this, because then it would be a bad process. So what we learned was that who will benefit from a district heating plant in, in, in two villages? So we asked around, we went to the grocery shop and asked the, you can be the grocery shop now. Who is the most important in this, in this uh, community here? And you'd point out, well, the blacksmith, over there you have the blacksmith, and uh, head of the, no, the head of the school. <laughs> and, uh, and you had some, some of the guys that would, would have an interest in this project. And we would then call them to a pre-meeting before the public meeting and say to them, well, we're going to make this project. What do you think about it? And the, and the plumber, the blacksmith, he said, well, there's 200 homes there that need to be converted from oil to district heating. I like this project. <laughs> it's going to feed my project. And the grocery would say, yeah, I've got to have a lot of activity. I'm going to feed all these guys. That's a good project, too. And the education program would say that we can make a, a line of, of green development because of this. And all these sort of interest in it. So we said to them, when we have the public meeting, please come and raise your hand when we ask for, for volunteer participant in a work group. Because we will help you. We'll not leave it to you. We'll help you a lot, but you have to, you have to be the local ambassadors of this, this project. OK, so now we have the public meeting. Anybody wants to participate in this local work group? Oh, yeah. And people could see, oh, these important persons, they, they volunteer for this project. Then I'd be part of it, too. OK, so we, we, in no time, we had a work group. And, and a very active work group, because they knew that they, what, they, what they were going to do. They didn't have to have a pre-meeting anyway. Because the problem is that we, on the one side, 
we have, we have the, I don't know who is, uh, you can be the environmental hippie now. <laughs> no, you're not a merchant anymore. So we had on one side the environmental hippies down from the straw bale house, down the, down the, the, the edge of the forest. And they, they were having all the right opinions. They would also say, why don't we do this and why don't we do that? And they were right, but the community was not ready for these kind of changes. And on the other side, you had the farmers, the radical conservative farmers saying that, well, they shouldn't decide what the community, we are the, we are the foundation of this community. And, and, and no, 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 they shouldn't disturb the, the peace. And <laughs> but, but we had to bring all these people together in the, in the project. And it was very neat, because you could see here, everybody here is, you can't, well, I can, try, I can say that, what are they, they, have, they have a beer in their hand, everybody. So this is occasion. One good reason to make a district evening is to have a beer one more time, to celebrate that we do something in the community. This is very important. We have straw. This is, this is a resource. From wheat and barley production, there's a surplus of straw. We use some of it for bedding for the, for the animals. We use some for food and some for, for composting in, in the soil. But we can still use 50, 60% of the, of the surplus uh, straw instead of oil. We still release some CO2, but it's CO2 neutral. I mean, the straw will absorb the same amount of CO2 that it releases when it's burned. So it's, it's better than oil anyway. And it's local. We buy it from the farmers. And we buy it at one-eighth of the price of oil per kilowatt hour. So this is what it's paying for the whole installation. So this is much cheaper and much better. And we have, we have some solar also. Actually, we wouldn't consider Denmark. I mean, probably say, you think that Denmark is dark all winter. And it is. <laughs> but in the summertime, we have long, long hours. We have sunshine until 11 o'clock in the evening sometimes in the midsummer. So, so these ones are producing about 25% of the yearly consumption in these villages is from this solar installation. So 25% from the solar panel makes sense because this is in the period where there's not a lot of space heating. So it's only for, for shower water and hot water. So it, there will be a lot of waste if you had the boiler running in the summertime. So now the, the solar panels can do the job in the summertime. That is sometimes some things worth, I don't know if you have a lot of solar here, but you have a lot of tourists. You should make the hot water by solar. That would be a very good idea. So the district heating is a good choice. We have, have district heating in these areas already established and sending the heating out to 75% to of all, all the consumption. We have a lot of houses out of, 60% of the houses is within the reach of district heating. There's a limit of how far you can send it out because then the heat loss in the pipes will be too significant. But 75% but of all heating is now from, um, from biomass. For electricity, we've established three, three and five wind turbines in the south. This is the cultivated, this is the farming area. So they're all situated down here in the, in the, in the very highly cultivated farming area. And these 11 turbines, they are producing all the electricity we need on a yearly basis, 25,000 megawatt hours. So that's quite neat, actually. And then the last thing is for transportation. We have had a hard time convincing people they should drive electric cars. I mean, you can't, you can't buy them. Anybody who has an electric car in this room? No? And I, I think you're reasonably positive thinking people, so you would probably have had an electric car if you could buy them on the market. The situation is that we cannot buy them. And instead of just kind of being, being depressive about that, we, what we did was we established these 10 offshore wind turbines south of Samsø, and the, they were meant to produce more energy than the entire island uses on transportation, including ferries and trucks and tractors and everything. And we send all this electricity to the mainland and reduce the CO2 emission from the carbon, from the coal-fired power plants. So we can say that we buy carbon credits to be allowed to drive the cars on, on fossil fuel. And until we have the battery cars where we then own the production facility and we can load the cars from, or charge the cars from our own production. And the total CO2 reduction because of this is 140% which for some people makes no sense. We cannot reduce more than 100%, but, but we export a lot of electricity to the mainland uh, to, to be able to compensate. So this means 140%. It actually means that every citizen on Samsung has reduced his carbon by minus 3.7 tons. So that's quite good. I think I, I, the average American is about 10 tons. Is that right? Nobody objects. That was a wild shot. I think in Denmark it's about seven or something like that, and you have a little higher consumption per capita. I don't know why. So the offshore wind turbines, when we talk about lo local ownership, is that this turbine is owned by a co-op, 
450 local people own this turbine. They form this co-op. And it's three and a half kilometers off the coast, and we can see it easily from the, from the coast. So we can see if it's spinning. Everybody's happy when it's spinning. If it's not, they call them the caretaker and say, why is my investment not working? <laughs> Number two, three, four, five, and number 10 is owned by the local municipality. They saw it was a good business to have the onshore wind turbine, so they thought that they might, might better be in business. So they got a permission from the government to invest in renewable energy technology to feed the school, the hospital, the old people's home, the street lights and the pumps and everything. All the public electricity consumption is, is fed by these turbines. One, two, three, four, five. Number six, eight, and nine is owned by small investment groups. It could be U5 sitting here or you guys over here. They, they formed small companies, individual companies, to own them. So they are, are privately owned by groups of people from the, from the island. And then number seven should have been owned by, in, in the same way, but in the last minute, one of the, the investors kind of couldn't raise the money. And, and we had to sell it elsewhere. So we asked an investment company to form a co-op and then invite people from the, the mainland, from, from the rest of Denmark, to be part owners. So we sent a message out to all the people who had family, rel relatives, uh, who had used to come on vacation, had summer houses there to invest in it. So 1,100 people own shares in this one. And every year we invite them to come visit their investment. <laughs> to, go, to go out there, we sell them a very expensive ticket on the boat. And they live in hotels and they have, the, they, you spend all their dividend on this trip. <laughs> so this is kind of a, a tourist trap again, uh, where we, we end up having, having a, a new business because of this. So this is just kind of a summary on, on the situation. You already heard that. So because of this, we, we, we become quite famous because of this, this project. It's, it's, not, it's not that special, but we have become quite this is, a, this is the mayor, this is my mayor. This, he was not the mayor that was, that was uh, the, the, having the, the competition. This is a new mayor from the same party, the Farmers Party. He's still very conservative, liberal, and, but he's nice anyway. <laughs> and he, he, this is the old engineer, it, this is the, cham the, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce. These, the, these are, he is driving this uh, drive of fame. <laughs> So they are having a treat because we are opening the Energy Academy. This is this building over here with solar panels on the integrated in the roof. So this is our new academy. This is the, the meeting house of energy development. We have, last year we had 5,000 visitors there from all over the world studying the projects we are, we are doing here. So this is a big celebration. The people of the island, they like it. And we have some national politicians. They have a tendency to appear whenever there's a television com camera there <laughs> and say, we did this. Yeah, we were <laughs> very nice project. You are very good people and I was here too. <laughs> what we do there is we made educational programs. This is the teachers of the, of the school. We take primary school uh, in energy camps and we teach them, you know Lego? This is the Lego island. And we teach them something about energy. We, we built small wind turbines hands on and we, we, try, we test them so they, can, they know where wind comes from, where energy comes from. I mean this young man he's quite convinced that solar energy is good. It's cooked on a solar cooker. Um, so he'll, he'll probably know about this when he comes home. We even bring the students to the nacelle of the wind turbine. This is 50 meters, what is that, five, 150 feet above, above ground. In a nacelle of the wind turbine, here's the gearbox and the generator. This is a 3,000 horsepower generator. This one turbine generates 2.3 million kilowatts hour per year. So we can say to these uh, students, hey, you, you guys, you live over here in the village. When you look out the window tomorrow, and the turbine is not spinning, what do you do then? Well, I might not switch on the light then. Okay, because what is it? it's very hard to communicate with, with young people because they have learned from us that we should just spend energy as much as we can because I mean, as long as we can afford it and pay the bill, it'll, it'll be eternal flow of electricity out, the, out of the block. So, so they learn that. I mean, when young people, they go out of bed, they switch on the light in the bedroom and they switch on the radio. They switch on the computer maybe, they go to the kitchen, the bathroom and they switch on everything, let the hot water run. And they go out in the kitchen and switch on the toaster and the, the coffee machine or whatever. And they go out in the corridor and they dress and they switch on the light there too and the outdoor light also. And when they leave the house it's on fire. <laughs> I don't know if your kids behave like this but this is what is happening at home. Even if they're very, very well educated these kids, they know everything about energy saving, energy conservation and climate change. They're taught every day about this. 
But I mean, they, they, they never, no, nobody ever can give them any consequences about this energy consumption. This is more like hands-on. They understand what this is, also because they're very scared of the vibration of the wind turbine. <laughs> they can feel the production, which is, it, this is a really hands-on situation. We bring in students from different places in the world also to have the same experience because it's, it's a very inspiring feeling to be there. We have had headlines in many different magazines. Latest, we had it in, in Time magazine. Once again, actually, the second article in the Time magazine. And this means that we are telling about this story worldwide all the time. This is the Chinese television station. And we are just this small project. It's a kind of embarrassing that there's not a lot of projects like this. So, so the, the, these TV guys, they can study more projects like, than us. But until then, we think it's, it's kind of a, it's good to be there. What we also use this for is a commercial, there's a commercial aspect of this. Because being a small community, it's very easy to be forgotten. When, when the government make, make its yearly um, financial statement, sometimes they forget about the islands for some reason. Because they, they, we are not, we're not on the, on the financial budget of the government. This is a pity. But being a, a famous energy island makes them t tend not to forget so much about the energy. So this is, this is my county mayor. And this is a county mayor of Chongming Island in China. You know, out of, next to Shanghai, they have the Yangtze River, this very big river. I mean, just a river mouth is as big as the sea my island is situated in. And out there, they have an island called Chongming Island, about 1,000 square kilometers. There's half a million people living on this island. And China has announced this island to be the all eco island, the Chinese answer to renewable energy island. And has to be ready in 2010 when the World Expo is going to be, take place in Shanghai. And, and they probably make it. And if somebody objects, they probably just move them somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> much, much more efficient than we are. No, no public meetings <laughs> and pre-meetings and discussions and all this uh, translation. I'm over here all happy because I then have a connection to the representatives of the Vestas Wind Turbine Company, the Grundfos and the Danfoss and all the big companies who are supplying equipment to this. Because they come in right after the troops and they do all the building and the construction. They are ready to export all the know-how and the technology. And then we can, we are the door openers to these projects. And they like us. They think we are very, very clever on this small island. Because they can make business out of it. Or we make presentation in EU. EU, we are announced to be a best practice project in the EU regional policy. So we, we made a lot of presentations in the new member states. I just came home from Romania, where they have a very, they have a very bad situation. They don't have any money, and the development is this difficult because they are very <laughs> scarce of money. So we advocate the, the development of local energy projects in these new member states. So, so I'm here down, down there in Brussels speaking about these things. Oh, we go to America. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Kansas, and I saw that there was a Vestas. This is the Danish Vestas company uh, establishing wind turbines in Kansas. In, in, I think it's called the Flint Hills out in the prairie. And I thought it was neat and we all, I went out to see it. I, then Enel, North America, Enel is an Italian energy company establishing wind turbine. I mean, Enel is an Italian energy company establishing Danish wind turbines in America. Come on. <laughs> this is not right. So, so we talked, I went down the road and I talked to some local rednecks <laughs> about, about, about their opinion of wind turbines. And I say, yeah, they are neat. We, we like them. We think they're good. I say, wouldn't it be neat to own them also? So, so they could do some good for the community. Ah, yeah, but that, that would be nice, but that can't be. That's not American tr tradition. We cannot do that. But some farmers, they think it's a good idea to lease land to the wind turbines so they can get a little income. But they should do better. I mean, you should come up with some ideas about how to do that. Because this is the, initially, this is, the, this is some sort of people. You remember the teacher? He's over here. And, and this is the accountant from the, from the Farmers Association. Over here you have the beefy farmer. <laughs> and they are all studying the, the, the construction. This is the construction of the offshore wind turbines, the foundation on a steel factory in Denmark. And we had a bus, bus ride up there and we invited everybody who wanted to invest in the wind turbine. And it was very interesting to see this old teacher. He maybe invested $600 in, 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 in a share in a wind turbine. He walked around and, <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. Let, I'd like to have one of these ones. <laughs> Costing several million kroner, but he was part of the process alongside with all the other guys. So in the bus at home, you could hear these guys talking like they were very big fellows. I mean, they <laughs> done some, done made some noise today. 
And, and this, but this is telling stories. It's good for the long winter nights to tell about what we did last year and what we're going to do in the future. This is, this is just an impression. We used to import for the value of 10 million US dollars every year to the island, split by 4,300 people. Well, you have to include all the tourists and all the others, but that's a lot of money per capita per year. We had to make, earn this money and, and buy, to buy costly oil and, and gasoline. So then we started the investment. So we have all together invested 75 million US dollars in 10 years. 65 million dollars is from local, local citizens, household companies, municipality and the entity company. And 10 million dollars is from national and EU framework. So that's a lot of money. And the good thing is about it is there's a 10 year payback frame on all the investments. So it's all bank financed and it works and it has proven that it actually works. So, so it's not like a state of the art project. It can be replicated in many different areas because it's recognized by the banking system and, and it's, it's, it's bank financed. To make this come through, we need reliable policy. I don't know, have you had reliable policy? <laughs> you had a, a couple of election periods now with reliable policy. You knew, knew what you had. Long-term framework and targets and recent budgets so everybody can see their own position in this development. It's, 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 it's very important that you can see what is possible for you. Local individual action plans, which can be spread. This, this island project is not one project. It's several projects in the project. There's an umbrella called the master plan of the Entity Island project. But under this, there's a several small projects, like one district heating, one wind turbine project, one solar scheme, and one biomass scheme, one insulation of housing scheme, one energy conservation scheme. And all these sort of schemes was individual projects that could easily live without the other ones. So we didn't have to recognize the whole scoop of projects at one time. So everybody could look, overlook what he or she kind of had uh, on, on the agenda. So it, made, it became much more realistic for people to understand the project. And then we need a very rare thing called brave politicians. Brave politicians means politicians who dare to make a decision that is maybe not popular now, because it's, it's, it's going to cost a little bit more up front, but maybe in the long run it will be very interesting to see how it works. And then you need more local heroes, people who are crazy enough to start these projects, like you on this, in this college and other places where people make decisions and they, they make a signature stamp a decision saying this is what we do here. This is our brand. This is very important. So in the future we got, we're going to drive electric cars. Sometimes I talk to young guys. Is there any young guys? Some of them up here maybe. I ask them what, what is going to be your next car? What is your dream car? And if they're a little bit younger they have some really impressive cars making a lot of noise. And they see themselves driving down the main road with a nice lady sitting next to them with a, with a stereo all, all winded up and making a lot of noise. And I, I, it's very hard to convince a guy like this that he should drive an electric car down the road. <laughs> I mean, it's all quiet. It doesn't say anything. And it doesn't smoke. And it doesn't, it, it's really, it's, it's like a, a disabled person car. And, 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 and who wants to make an impression on a girl with a, with a car like that? That's not, that's not nice. When, so then I tell them that in America that there's, a, there's a car manufacturer called Tesla, Tesla Motor. They, they produce, hand built a car that can rev from 0 to 100 in 3.7 seconds. I don't know what that is in mind, but that's very fast. Much faster than a Ferrari. It will outrun any car at all, and they say to them, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, but the noise, they still, they still need some noise. They say, I'm pretty sure you can get a, the, the noise of a Ferrari and put it in the stereo. <laughs> 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 then we're getting somewhere. <laughs> so that might be the future. Then you can say that this is, might be also one good reason. We should, we should start thinking intelligent instead of this. So this is, this is the last time we were, we were away. We, we have a COP15 meeting in Copenhagen in December where the world nations is going to negotiate the Kyoto Protocol once again. And we have some new targets. And we have great expectations for you guys to, to sign, to co-sign this and have some targets where we can meet some goals. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. And uh, if you want to know more, we have a website um, called the Energy Academy or energyacademy.dk. There's a lot of info there. And uh, you probably hide, hide this 
this website somewhere. So if anybody wants it, we can have a poster somewhere where you can see the, the website. We have a lot of pictures and there's a 10-year there's a uh, evaluation report where you can see all the findings, what happened. You can see some figures also, some figures and numbers. So you can get into details what, what really happened and what, uh, what succeeded and what, what didn't succeed so much. There's, some good, good, um, there's a COP15. You can see what happens in Copenhagen in December for the top, top meeting. And then there's a book about this. You can find it on Concept for Hire, DK slash Wind, written by my wife. It's a very, very nice, she's a photographer. She made some beautiful pictures. Is that okay, a little commercial now? Okay. <laughs> no, but you can, you can have a pre-look at, at these uh, pictures because she followed the project uh, in, in, its, in the project period. Okay, so, yeah. So maybe, maybe you'll, I just put this slide on, it's a nice slide. Sure. We'd love to do a question and answer session uh, now, and Soren will repeat your questions into the mic, um, just so we can catch it for the, uh, for MPDN. Yes? I have a question with regard to the uh, automobile uh, companies in the United States, like GM and Chrysler. I would think that they could make wind turbines and instead of automobiles, and I, I, I just feel that that's a perfect place for us to make these beautiful turbines that we can do. Is that something that would seem feasible to you in your thinking? Yeah, the question, the question is if, if, question is if, if, if the G, G, GM would switch from automobiles to turbines. Would switch, switch from, from automobile, automobile production to, to make wind turbines. Actually, actually, you have GE wind. General Electric, they have a wind company now, and they produce, a, they are competitors. We don't like them so much because they produce a lot of good wind turbines. <laughs> so you're already in, in the right direction. But, I, but I'm pretty sure that the financial crisis package that's sent out to help the companies, they have asked a lot of, they, 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 they've given conditions for the money spent in the automo automobile industry to, to, to start producing electric cars and modified uh, uh, hybrid cars maybe also to study that. And I know that the Danish wind turbine manufacturers, they, they meet some, some, some regulations in America. If they want to export wind turbines to America, there's some conditions that a percentage of the wind turbine has to be produced over here. So I know the best turbine company, they have built now four factories in America where they, they produce towers and blades for wind turbines. And I think they, they have two more in, in, the, in the planning. So it will, it will turn out to be an active area of development where you, you're going to do your bit. So, and it's not rocket science and you can do that. I mean, you should just make a decision and start producing and we'll be out of business in no time. <laughs> but so, so take it easy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, the question is about migrating birds and the influence of the wind turbines. Uh, yes, and we, we did consider that because <clears throat> that has been a question in Denmark for several years actually. And every time there was a new permission given to wind turbines, there was, a, there was attached a condition to this permission from the government. And that was the bird watchers and the nature organizations. They were then asked to make a two-year survey to study what happened in these areas to demonstrate what, what was the real impact on the bird life when they established wind turbines. On the first hand, you had, you, had, you had to base it on what they already knew. So if they knew that this was a migrating route, nobody was giving permission to, to establish the turbines right in the, in the migrating route, the fly-in route or the fly-out route. So they had to find another place. And then they had bird watchers out there every day for two years to calculating how many birds passed and what did they do, did they behave in, the, in a different way, and, and what, what was the number of birds in the, in the breeding period, in the migration period, and in the winter period. And, and there's several books about it. I, I, can give you, I can give you the website. It's also in English from the Danish authority who have made these surveys in six or seven of the biggest wind turbine uh, uh, um, 
uh, what we call establishment in, in Denmark. So there's a long and very serious investigation in, of, of this, this project. And there's, well, the basic result of this is there's no direct impact because of the wind turbines on the number of birds uh, nesting in the area, May, mainly because we, we kept them at a distance of the, of the nesting area. And the birds, the, the turbines are so big now that the birds can see them in a the distance and they fly around them. You have the cormorants would sit on the railing. I remember the picture of the, of the wind turbines. There's kind of a landing on the wind turbine. And on this landing, there's a handrail all the way around there. And the, and the, and the cormorants would sit there. And I mean, they group up there and sit there. And you have the blades just swing over the head, and they don't mind it. And actually, what happens is that around the offshore wind turbines, we have a protected fishing area. So fishermen are not allowed to, to, to fish with dragging nets there or trawlers or anything else like. So you have a protected area where, the, you, where you can breed f little fish. And the foundation of the wind turbine would create a reef. Every turbine is a new reef, and there's a lot of, of little fish there. So the, the, the cormorants especially is feeding in the area. So, so it's, it's a win-win situation for many reasons. Of course, there's some disturbances, but, but, but not as, as you imagine. I, ha I have this, every time we have visitors there, I have this question. Every time, no, no exemption. So sometimes I get a little annoyed and I try to be tricky. So I say to people, okay, you can choose one of the 11 onshore turbines. You can choose which one we want to go to. And they pick it on the map and say, okay, we we'll go to this one. Okay, we go out there. If you're in a diameter of 200 meters around this turbine, find one dead bird, I'll pay the lunch and the beer. <laughs> and only, I only got to pay the beer one time. That was because one of my colleagues, he brought a dead bird out there <laughs> and put it there. Because it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. It did happen years ago in the 70s or 80s when they built them in, the, in, the, in California. I can, it, there was a, a Swift Valley or... I cannot remember. They, they put it right in the middle of a gorge, a lot of small, very fast spinning wind turbines. And there were some cormorants or some eagles. They, they were killed by, birds, by the blades there. And I think they, they just kind of... These birds, they just fly sleeping. Because birds are not stupid. They wouldn't fly directly into the wind turbines. And they got hit. And some of the prey birds... They have a, like, like a jet fighter, they, they, can, they focus on the prey, and they had these ladders towers where the small birds, they had nests in the ladders towers, and they sat there on the, on the ladders of the towers, and the prey birds kind of just dived in to catch the birds, and they were hit by, by the blades also. But, but, I mean, this is long ago, and there's a lot of experience after that. I might have been advocating too much. It's not like, I, I understand the question, I, I, I appreciate it also. It's, it has to be taken into consideration. Of course. Um, uh, you might be familiar with Cape Wind. Yeah. Uh, it took a sound, and that's been working for a long time. One of the big objections to it is the visual impact for especially for people who live on the water. And I'm wondering if that happened in your community. It, it's a question about the visual impact on, 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 on the wind turbines. Yes, we, we, we know about the visual impact. When we established the offshore wind turbines, especially, not, not so much the onshore wind turbines, because they were put in the farming area, and we didn't have a lot of discussion about that. Some, but that was for many different reasons. One was the church. We have five medieval churches on the island, about a thousand years old, very beautiful old churches. And, and uh, what do you call the, the people who, who are in the, the parish here? Yeah. They, 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 they would object to this. They said, well, we don't want turbines near the churches. I mean, near the churches, that was half a mile, that was, no, half a mile away from the, from, the, from the churches because they reckoned, this is going to be so noisy, we cannot hear the Sunday choir, and we cannot hear, well, which, which was a completely rubbish. It, it, it was not true at all. They sent a complaint to the Minister of Church in Denmark, and then sent us a note saying that if you by any means harm the, the, the you could say, the surroundings of these medieval churches, we'll complain about this. And we said, this is going to be complicated because we cannot argue. I mean, there's several, there's some people we cannot argue with. So, so we, said, we said that, well, we, we, we will withdraw this, this, this area and get out of it. But that not because it meant something visually or noise-wise, but just because people objected. And when we had the offshore wind turbines, we had three positions where we could have them, the offshore turbines. So one was west of Samsu, west of the island, where the sunset is. And some people found out that they had summer houses there. They'd sit out on the, on the, on the, on the porch, having the, the, the g and in the afternoon, and they'd suddenly see the, the, the sun dip, and they could see the, the turbine spin out there in the sunset, and they didn't like that. So they objected, and we said, oh, come on. But, but anyway, we knew that we'd have a lot of trouble, because many of these 
wealthy people who have the summer houses, they also have a lot of influence and we'll have a lot of trouble if we try to force that through. So we said, okay, let's find the least populated area and have them there, namely in the south where there's no sunset, no sun up, just directly south. You have the sun right in your eye when you look at, out to see them. So you, you'll be more or less blinded <laughs> looking at them. And there was no objection at, at all. I, from the Cape and the Cape wind, I, we've been in, on Master's Vineyard making, making a presentation there. And they, liked, they had this project called the Vineyard Unplugged. Which was this, and they wanted to be an independent energy island also. But then we started the, discussing about wind turbines. And they said, well, that's maybe not a solution for us. <laughs> and they had these big, massive summer houses. You probably know about that here. <laughs> and these guys, they stay here for two weeks per year, and they have a saying, I, I, they really have a saying about this. So this is the problem of the Cape Wind project. I mean, that's way out in the sea, but still they can't, they can't make it because of, of what they think is, is, a, is a serious visual impact. What they say is that they'll, it'll, it'll bring down the, the value of the houses. I mean, come on. They, they have so many rooms, so many square meters, they have an energy consumption of, I mean, of 10 family houses or more than that. I wonder what's your view of using the tide? I just, this is the question about using the tide. Tidal energy is, is an issue. We don't have tide in Denmark, so we don't use that. But I've been in Ireland and Scotland where they have a significant tide also. I've seen. Yeah, I saw it this morning. <laughs> if you have a narrow sound where you have a lot of water passing, then there's a lot of energy in the tide. There is some projects where you have an, up, an upside down wind turbine, more or less. There's some systems where they test them in the British Canal and in, in some of the, the, the Irish and Scottish between the islands and, and, and the sea there. And they have these propellers hanging in a, in a hydraulic system where they can lower them in the water. So this, is a, this could be a way to go. Well, it's, it's, it's not really mature yet. I think it needs some more testing before it's proven technology, the, the, the title. But the title is, is this. We have, I used to, to make this picture. You have a square meter, square, uh, a cubic meter of air passing through the, the, the you know, riding at the speed of five miles per hour, right? When it hits you, it kind of messes up your hairdo a little. If you have a, a cubic meter of water, traveling with a, with a speed of five miles per hour, it'll make a hole in the wall. <laughs> so that's, that's a different of energy. Huh? It's a very predictable force. It, yeah, it is. So that could be a nice way of you to go. Um, I have a question about, I'm in the Maine legislature, and a number of us are actually working on trying to get the upbeat and tariff for Maine. We're behind, behind you uh, on that. But I had two quick questions. One of the biggest concerns that comes up is uh, people who are concerned that general rate payer rates might go up for general rate payers. Um, and then, and I am wondering if that was an issue when, I'm not sure when Denmark passed it, but if that was an issue and how you, how you dealt with that or how that was responded to. Um, and I'm also wondering, out of curiosity, if you think this project would have gone forward if the reliability created from the feed-in tariff did not exist. Yeah, it's a question about the feed-in tariff and the, and, and the importance of, of the difference of, of price, if, if a higher price when the feed-in tariff is, 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 uh, is introduced, and if it has, 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 has an effect also on, on the, on the re realization of the project if there was no feed-in tariff. I, I am sure that we have a better condition than you have because we have a high energy price because of high taxes. We have carbon taxes and a high, high energy consumer's tax. And this has been a tool that the government has used for many years in Denmark, that we raised the tax on consumption of energy. So, and this, this tax money is then redirected into research and development of renewable energy technology. This is one of the basis of, 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 of wind turbine development, that they had great subsidies in the beginning for the, for the development of the technology. So if you have low energy prices and then want to have a feed-in tariff, who, who's going to pay for that? So, so it's true, it can have a, a bad effect of people's understanding of renewable energy because it's cost a little more. <coughs> so, sorry. Oh. That was a, sorry. <laughs> Her headphone fell off. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, so, so, so maybe politically it's a good idea to announce that we'll have a higher CO2 tax on energy consumption. 
to encourage people to save energy and then redirect this. This has to be politically decided that this money has to be used to encourage tidal energy or the establishment of wind turbines or other things. So it goes hand in hand, kind of. I'm pretty sure that if we had low energy prices and no feed-in tariff, we wouldn't have been able to make wind turbines in Samsung. I want to just explain the, the investment. So a farmer says, I'd like to invest in that project. He goes and says, I've got a reliable investment, goes to the bank and borrows that money to invest. Is that how it works? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the question is about how, how, how it's financed. Well, if you get a permission to, the, to, for, to our wind turbine, for example, then you, have, then you have a business. That's a business potential. So you, you, <clears throat> the wind turbine companies, they, they consult you and they give you free advice. So they send out a consultant, an engineer who will make, a, uh, they put up a meter maybe if they don't know it, but we have software that can calculate almost exactly how much a wind turbine of a certain size will produce at any specific geographical point in Denmark, like a GPS thing. You could put in the brand of turbine, Avestas 250, um, serial number, this will produce so much here. And he can go to the bank with, this, with these calculations and say, can I, can I borrow money for this? And if he's not a crook, I, I, he'd be, most certainly he'll be given the money. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the wind doesn't blow all the time. What percentage of the time must your island draw power from the mainland? The question is, there's no not 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 wind all the time, and what what then? <laughs> and that's true. We have calm days where there's almost no wind. But as you saw, we, the onshore 11 megawatt they produce the entire average consumption per year. And then we have an extra production of 80,000 megawatt hours. We only use 23,000 uh, megawatt hours from the offshore wind turbine, which is also directed through the island consumption. So if we have a low one day, then we'll, st we'll consume from the offshore wind turbines and the export will be minimized. On a very rare day, we, we, there's absolutely no wind, it's completely calm. Then we get some of the electricity back from the grid connection to the mainland. So they feed us back. And what we like to say is that we are connected. We have a, we have a, corporate, we have a corporate agreement with Norway and they have a lot of hydropower in Norway. So on very windy days, they shut the hydropower and they buy cheap wind power electricity from Denmark. And on calm days, we buy it back again at the same price. So we have a shared cost of, of exporting, importing hydropower and wind power. So this is actually very brilliant. This is a battery thing. And it, it works as long as we can agree on this. <laughs> so so um, it doesn't cause more carbon, in, carbon dioxide in, in, in the atmosphere when we do that. Yeah, that's quite good, actually. So you can do that with uh, New Brunswick or other places where they have a lot of hydro. But you, you also quite have a lot of hydro in Maine. So if you connect it to the hydro, well, I mean, you don't, you don't have a lot of wind power yet. As long as you don't have more wind power than hydropower, then you could swap and say that on, on a dry summer, you save some of the water for later. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. It, it, the, the, the question is the impact of the, of the project financially and, and according to jobs and, and possibilities, yeah? I, I, think, I think, well, we estimated that we in the construction period had about 30 man-year jobs in the project. That was the first five or six years of the project when we built and built and built all the time. But of course, we cannot continue to build more construction. So now it's maintenance and, and, and the running of it. And then we maybe down to 10, 10 12 persons. But we still refurbish houses. We still make insulation and improvement of, of the houses. And actually, now we're going to start up a campaign of, of, uh, of making even better standards of the houses. One of the financial crisis packages from the national government is going to refurbish old houses for insulation and, and better standards. So, so they'll be busy again. But the young people, they, they leave the island no matter what. I mean, we cannot offer them education. We don't have a university. We don't even have a high school there. So when they're 15 years old, our youngest son, he just left home, so, and he never come back again. 15 years old, that's kind of early. They grow, they grow, grow up quite, quite, quite quickly on an island. And, and, and the problem is that we cannot offer them good, good 
academic jobs. So if they get a good education, they never come back. Well, only on vacation or when they retire to play golf and fish. Um, for the financial thing, I think we did a lot of good. We saved the island from, from, from you say, bankruptcy almost. If we hadn't made this project, I, I'm pretty sure that we'd been under administration from another municipality. We'd lost the independent structure we have now. Uh, but because we did this, I mean, they couldn't just close us down because we, we produce kind of, I don't know how much it is, but we produce a lot of the local economy locally. So it means something for the local community. Well, I think we have one more, one more question in the back here, and then, and then we'll wrap up. Good. Uh, about installing the wind turbines and, and all the power grid, how much was it, was the, was it complicated for the power system, power grid, to accommodate the wind turbines? And if it was, was it, uh, was it modified by the state or by the county or by the private investors? Yeah, the, the laws, the feed-in law says also that it, it's called, this, we, have, we have a percentage of what we pay per kilowatt hours is called public service obligation, PSO uh, tax. And this money goes to, to maintain the grid and to extend the grid whenever it's, it's necessary. So the turbines are, are, are meant, when we do the investment of the turbine, we do the cabling up till the public grid. And where the connection is, from the connection to the transformer station, that's, that's for, for, the, for the community. That's an electrici electricity problem. So that, that, that's, be, that's been added on to the, the, to the consumers. Uh, and it's taken from the public service payment. So this is maintaining the grid. You probably also have a net tariff or something that, that is maintaining the transportation and the maintenance of, of, of the grid. For the onshore turbines, we could do what, what, what the transformer station, the system we already had. We didn't have to extend it or expand it or anything else. We could just connect to it and it still worked. And the cabling to the, net, to the mainland was strong enough. We had an extra cable because every now and again there's a drifting tanker with an anchor that rips the hole in the, in the cable. So we have to, to switch to the reserve cable until it's fixed again. So we had enough capacity also to do that. When we did the offshore wind turbines, we needed to extend the, the transformer station with a new, bigger transformer. But that was also on the public service obligation. We didn't have to pay for that. So we had to pay for the cabling onto to the shore, to the public grid. And from there on, it was, an, it was the public uh, system that paid for the rest of it. And it's all taken care of. I mean, years ago, they, the, the utility company said that we can only handle 5% wind turbine in the public system. Otherwise, the system will go wobbly and we cannot control the quality of electricity. Today, we have 21%. Sometimes we have up to 100% in part of Denmark on a windy day, and they still have quality electricity. We cannot see anything. So they can control anything. Uh, and and, and this, is, this is just one excuse for the electricity companies to get paid for the service. <laughs> they say, it's very difficult, very complicated to handle the wind turbines. We need an extra, uh, an extra feed-in uh, tariff to, to be able to handle that. But, but they demonstrated that they can handle much more than what they said in the beginning. Soren, thank you so much. This is, this is the one. Okay.